Hi, I'm Kevin Dooley. I'm a professor in supply chain management at Arizona State University and chief scientist at the Sustainability Consortium. And I want to thank you for, uh, for inviting me to make some virtual comments um, here on the panel on, on supply networks and complexity science. Um, uh, as Tom Troy uh, has mentioned or will mention, uh, we've worked together for uh, many years with many colleagues on developing the concept of supply networks, and in particular, applying a complexity science perspective to supply networks. And I want to talk about some of my experiences in the sustainability consortium that touch upon uh, both the, the concept and operationalization um, of the supply network. So, um, you know, a, about the time that uh, complexity science um, was becoming aware um, to both uh, the scholarly uh, community as well as, as practitioners, um, the concept of networks was also emerging. And people became very comfortable with the concept of social networks because of social media and the fact that a social network was kind of embedded in the description. It was the de facto kind of archetype model of social media. And so people became very, uh, I think, comfortable with the concept of, of networks. Um, we know on the scientific side, the initial uh, applications of complexity science were to look at some of the risks in large-scale infrastructure networks, such as uh, telecommunications or, or power grids. And uh, as our own community began to work on applying uh, the network concept to our supply chains, um, uh, while uh, the phrase supply network is still less heard than the, than the phrase supply chain in practice, I know that when I use the term supply network either with other colleagues um, who are doing other work or uh, in uh, business circles, that there is uh, an ease and comfort uh, with the term supply network. There's a realization that it more accurately describes the complexity that is in their actual uh, value chains. And um, uh, we can see that um, practitioners are beginning to use this concept of supply networks um, in their own thinking and business planning. So an example of that is in the sustainability consortium, uh, we've created a method called commodity mapping that uses a combination of both network thinking and place-based thinking. And I'll come back to that theme uh, later here in my comments. Uh, but first, uh, we try to understand as much as possible about a particular company's uh, sourcing network in order to better understand, for example, where their particular agricultural commodities come from. And uh, we then might know, for example, that they buy 40% of their coffee um, comes in through the New Orleans port and 60% of their coffee comes in from the LA port, um, and, but that's as much as they know. And so we then use trade networks um, to come up with a probabilistic map of where the coffee might come from um, because we know the growing regions and we know from trade data the networks in which um, those commodities, where they go after they're grown and harvested and can come up with a probabilistic map of where the coffee was sourced from. We then lay that over with place-based um, modeling, for example, looking at water risk um, or risk of child labor um, to better understand the risks that might exist then within the, the supply network. So that's an example of how you know today's business decision-making is being influenced by both the, the concept and the techniques associated with, with supply networks. Um, supply networks uh, are going to be risky things in the future. We had a, a recent article uh, by, by Tom and others um, about how uh, I believe there was risk involved in, um, uh, in nationalism um, and tariff-related uh, activity um, to supply networks. Supply networks will also be riskier because of climate change. So. Um, when we look at a particular city or a particular organization with facilities in a particular region um, or maybe uh, uh, harvesting or growing or agricultural um, activities, we can think about, you know, the, the impacts at that one site 
And depending on where that site is, where that city is, there's going to be very different impacts. Um, some places may have primarily to deal with uh, sea level uh, rise, for example. Other places may have to do with extended drought or, um, or rain. And um, uh, the thing about supply networks is that the risk at the supply network level is an aggregation of all of those place-based risks. So even if things are, quote, normal or not um, deteriorating at a particular point in the supply network, they may be somewhere else. And we see that, we know that instinctively when we look at natural or other types of disasters that occur and are spontaneous. Um, we see that one, you know, that a tsunami can take out a supplier and change um, the paint industry because of the criticality of a supplier in that particular region. But I think more so we're going to see sensitivity and unfortunately the, the reality where there are chronic changes um, at different portions of the supply network and that causes um, the need for structural change uh, and adaptation and resilience um, at those network points. Um, the the interaction with the sustainability community that we've had over the last 10 years has taught me that ecologists um, think about the world in a landscape manner. Um, the things that make a difference are the things that are physically close to one another. So, for example, if you've got some, some birds and some land animals and some plants and trees and a body of water in what we would call a watershed, then understanding that system and its complexities and interactions is something that's bounded by that, that physical uh, proximity. If you think about it more broadly, um, really we manage the whole uh, society um, and earth largely on a place-based uh, thinking model. So we have school districts, uh, we have cities that have transportation systems. The things that make a difference, the things that influence one another, are the things that are approximately close to one another. Supply chain thinking is almost orthogonal um, to that kind of landscape model. So supply chains connect places, physical places, that are otherwise not next to one another, not proximal. And therefore, the effect in one location, even though it's not near another location because of a supply chain, and the economic activity that occurs between those distant places, there are effects. So in fact, um, we will, for example, here in Phoenix, um, there will be some indirect effect of, uh, let's say, lessening sea ice in the Arctic, because in fact, um, very practically, there will be changing trade routes. And so for certain uh, commodities and flows, um, if you don't have to go through uh, the Panama Canal and you can go around um, the top of, of Canada or Russia or whatnot um, through the Arctic Sea, it opens up different trade routes. It changes costs and times and uh, access to markets and so on. Um, so that's, you know, you could even look at that as potentially a positive effect, but certainly a change in how uh, markets that are otherwise disconnected from uh, the the de-icing of the North Pole might in fact be um, uh, impacted because of, uh, of various um, connections to that within their supply network. Um, so I want to close with uh, an interesting uh, style of thinking, an interesting approach that the World Wildlife Fund uh, created in, to address deforestation. And it combines both this horizontal thinking, this landscape thinking, as well as vertical supply chain thinking. And another way to look at it is that in uh, when we talk about ecosystems and their, their quality and their health resilience, um, that primarily defined by, by things at the landscape level. Um, and so when we try to conser conserve natural resources, for example, um, those are landscape management type efforts. When we try, however, to use market forces to influence the practices that, let's say, suppliers have in that particular region so that they don't, for example, use deforestation as a means to acquire more land, um, that, that we can think of as a, a vertical force or a market force. 
So WWF created something called the jurisdictional approach that tries to combine both the market forces and the regional forces, in particular um, the governmental and policy and investment levers that exist at that local level um, to create the best of both worlds. And so if you're in a jurisdictional region, then you're going to get both a, a, a top-down market signal right, from your downstream customers that following certain sustainable practices is going to lead to better market access, perhaps even a, a market price premium. You're getting then support from both the government, local NGOs, local universities to develop workforce, to implement um, uh, worker health and safety procedures, to implement appropriate procedures to um, uh, measure uh, level of afforestation, et cetera. Uh, and so it is attempting to, to both uh, use the, the market, but also the local community and its cultures and values um, and own incentives in developing itself in its capacity. And there, if you're in one of those regions, then all of the, for example, farmers or fishers uh, would be certified um, and that would then uh, give them access uh, and perhaps again a price premium in the, mar in the market. So uh, thank you for letting me share some thoughts and have a good time at your the rest of the panel.